Thanks for downloading this episode of On the Record Online with Eric Schwartzman, the podcast about how technology is changing the world of communications. To subscribe to the podcast or share feedback, visit us online at ontherecordpodcast.com, on Twitter at On the Record, or send email to ontherecordpodcast at gmail.com. Our guest is Jonathan Crotty. He's a partner at the law firm Parker Poe in Charlotte, where he heads their employment and benefits practice, representing employers in all aspects of their employment relationship, from hiring to discharge. Jonathan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Now, last month, a federal administrative law judge backed the NLRB's position challenging a social media policy that did not seek to control the employee's message, but to require that she state that her opinions are not necessarily those of the company. That's correct. It was a case involving the Kroger grocery store chain, and they had issued a social media policy, like many companies do, that, among other things, asked employees when they were talking about the company on social media to identify themselves as not speaking on behalf of the company. Well, General I, want, I, I do want to get into that, but before we get into into what happened here, give us the backstory on the NLRB and their previous challenges to social seek to, seek to control what employees say about them and their jobs on social media. Sure. When you think about the NLRB, you know most of us think about unions and union elections and union negotiations, and we don't think that much about non-unionized employers. But there's a provision in the National Labor Relations Act uh, called Section 7 that deals with protected concerted activity. And what that means is that the law prohibits employers from taking action against employees who gather, get together to talk about or deal with terms and conditions of employment. So when this law was passed back in the 1930s or so, of course, the Internet wasn't here and Facebook and social media didn't exist. And concerted activity generally dealt with employees who physically got together and talked about problems they were having at work. But over recent years, what has happened is is that the NLRB has started interpreting Section 7 and concerted activities to apply to employees' social media use uh, and criticism or discussions about their company and the workplace on social media. So for the last five to seven years or so, employers have been dealing with a string of decisions and interpretations from the NLRB as to what is permitted in the social media use policy and what isn't permitted. And that's really the whole background um, for this particular decision. Now, a while back, I remember there was also some speculation that because some NLRB judges were appointed during a congressional recess, that previous decisions challenging employer policies could someday be invalidated. Is that still the case? Well, the, the concern is still there, and there's actually a Supreme Court opinion that's supposed to come down that deals with that, but it really doesn't deal with the administrative law judge, the trial, the trial judges for the NLRB. That case deals with the board members themselves who are the ones who hear the appeals from the administrative law judges. So we are supposed to get an opinion from the Supreme Court, perhaps even uh, within the next couple of weeks dealing with that issue, but it really won't affect the, the trial court level, the administrative law judge such as the one in the Kroger case. So what is a federal administrative judge? What does it mean that the judge backed the NLRB's position? Can that, can, you know, can that be challenged? Walk us through the players here. Sure. It, it certainly can be challenged. What happened in this case is that the NLRB's general counsel office basically filed an administrative complaint against Kroger challenging its social media policy, probably based on an employee complaint. Uh, the first level of review is kind of the trial court level. That's the administrative law judge who is an, uh, uh, judge that hears these types of federal administrative cases. And there was a mini trial and administrative hearing that went on. Both cases, or both sides got to put on their evidence. Uh, and afterwards, the ALJ released this opinion declaring many aspects of the Kroger social media to be invalid. Uh, if Kroger, and I'm assuming Kroger has appealed this, I couldn't go online and find out whether the appeal's actually been filed or not, but Kroger would appeal that decision to the full NLRB, which is the uh, the appointed members of the board who will then hear the case and will make a decision as to whether or not to affirm the decision of the ALJ, 
And if one of the parties is unhappy with the NLRB's decision, they can then go to federal court. So eventually it will get in the hands of uh, a federal court and federal judges and maybe even Supreme Court eventually. So this is far from over. Correct. This is just the first step uh, in this. And the ALJ decision is not binding precedent. What that means is that it won't be used by other ALJs at this point um, as, as something that they're, they feel that they're required to follow as NLRB precedent. That would be the board decision itself, the next level of appeal. Now, you wrote a piece about this, and we'll have a link to that piece in the show notes for the podcast, but I want to read a couple paragraphs here. Uh, the Kroger Company of Michigan versus Granger involved an unfair labor practice charge filed by an employee based on the employer's online communications policy. The policy required, among other things, that employees identifying themselves as such include the disclaimer in any postings that involved the company. The complaining employee received a written warning when she failed to comply with this requirement, and then you wrote, the ALJ, the administrative law judge, concluded that the Kroger policy violated Section 7, which you mentioned, of the NLRA because it could deter employees' rights to engage in concerted activity. Requiring use of the disclaimer each time an employee posts information involving the company was unreasonably burdensome, regardless of the fact that the employer never sought to control the content of the message. Read literally, it would require use of a disclaimer, even in situations where the employee liked some other content on Facebook. So, so first, do you know specifically how she failed to comply? I don't know, and it's really not specified in the, uh, in the facts that are set forth in the decision itself. Uh, usually what ends up happening is that the employee has a blog uh, or that uh, a supervisor finds out that a bunch of employees are on Facebook uh, criticizing the company, criticizing the customers, criticizing management. It gets back to human resources, and some type of disciplinary action is initiated. So could you see a solution to drafting a social media policy that would require a disclaimer but not be unreasonably burdensome? Uh, you could. A disclaimer that says that the employee can't act in any way by which they're representing themselves as speaking on behalf of the company is probably within this decision's, um, uh, the allowable decision. What the ALJ said is that, look, in most circumstances, an employee who goes online and starts talking about their job, nobody thinks they're talking about or on behalf of the company or that they're representing the company. Now, if they, for instance, fake the press release or something like that, that would be a different story, and the ALJ indicated that the social media policy could uh, protect against employees who, in essence, intentionally misrepresent themselves as speaking on behalf of the company. And what if the policy recommended or suggested employees consider a disclaimer? Could that still be seen as having the subtle risk of chilling effects on free speech rights? Yeah, exactly. The the judge, and as many of these social media cases, actually the companies never try to enforce these policies against concerted activity. But what the NLRB has said is that the very existence of the policy uh, creates a chilling effect. Employees will never engage in the concerted activity because they're afraid they're going to get in trouble, basically. So I think there's a possibility that even if there was a suggestion that disclaimers be used, the NLRB could take the position that that, that still creates a chilling effect and still violates Section 7. It, it's not as not as egregious, probably, in the NLRB's view as the Kroger language, but it, I don't think it, it gives you any immunity. We're talking to Jonathan Crotty. He heads up the employment and benefits practice at Parker Poe in Charlotte. And when we return, he's going to talk to us about what this all means for employers and social media policies. Stay with us. Let me ask you a question. How are you managing social media risk? Because your social media policy isn't going to help you manage social media risk. In fact, only two out of every 1,000 people even open the terms of service before signing up for an online service. So the truth is, no one reads your social media policy. They sign for it and stick it in the bottom drawer. I'm not knocking social media policies. They're what justify disciplinary action but they don't get people to comply and they don't teach people how to use social media effectively for business. In fact, after your legal team gets through with it, your social media policy probably discourages your employees 
to share your messages with their personal social networks. So what are you supposed to do? How do you manage the risks and capitalize on the opportunity? How do you scale social media engagement in the workplace effectively and responsibly? The answer is social media training, assessment, and certification. But not live training. It's too expensive and impractical. Cloud-based, on-demand, social media literacy and compliance training is the answer. Training you can give everyone in your company. Training they can take anytime, anywhere, on any device. Training that's so useful, so entertaining, and so current, it's an employee benefit. We've introduced the world's broadest, deepest catalog of social media literacy and compliance training courseware. It's auditable, so you get a record of who knows what, and it's accessible via desktop or mobile, so employees can access it on their own terms. For a free trial, go to ontherecordpodcast.com forward slash comply socially. See for yourself how you can use our system to manage the risks associated with social media in the workplace. You can even earn a social media compliance certificate. Go to ontherecord.com forward slash comply socially and access your free trial. If you're spending all your time worrying about crisis preparedness, take half of that effort and put it into crisis prevention. Before someone says something that damages your reputation, before you leak customer data, before you get fined by the Federal Trade Commission, certify your people certify yourself. So what if you decided on, on your own accord to use a disclaimer as an employee? Would that be okay? Sure. Yeah, the, the employee can certainly come to the conclusion that, you know, for my own self-preservation, uh, to, I want to make it clear that I'm speaking on behalf of myself and not the company. Probably a good idea on the employee's behalf um, and certainly no legal issues involved with doing that. What protections, if any, does that give the employee or the employer? Like, for example, the person says that their opinions are their own, but maybe they happen to be in a position of authority or a manager. Could they still be seen as representing the organization, and might the organization still be liable for what they say? Yeah, I think it's certainly possible. For example, let's say that uh, an, an insider on the company disclosed uh, information that would be deemed uh, illegal insider trading under securities laws or disclosure of that information. I don't think the fact that they put a disclaimer in there alone is going to give them much protection or is going to give the company protection from accusations that it didn't act properly to instruct uh, and restrict its, its executives or managers. So. Um, there certainly could be situations where it, it would not provide protection. But, you know, the typical talking about how things are going at work or things are not going at work, I think a disclaimer is not a bad idea for the employee to include. Now, in, in legal circles, when you get uh, on the topic of social media policies, mm -hmm. um, issues concerning the NLRB have been the number one topic for so many years now, particularly this chilling, you know, this, this potential to chill um, workers' rights to protest wages, hours, and working conditions uh, publicly, even if it disparages their employer on social media. Do you see this now as being as big of a deal, this idea that you can't require employers to state that their opinions are, are their own? I, I just think it's a creeping progression of NLRB positions and cases that are causing, and the cumulative weight of all of these cases is causing a lot of employers to ask, are they really entitled to have any restrictions whatsoever on employee social media use? You've got this decision. You've got another one fairly recently where the NLRB says that you can't prevent employees from using your logo on their blogs um, or their Facebook pages. You've got another recent decision um, that says that, that what we had advised employers for a while was in your employee handbooks or your social media policy to put some disclaimers in there that say, look, this is not intended and it won't be used to chill your concerted activity rights. And the NLRB is now saying that, well, those disclaimers may not be enough. Those may not help you because they're not explicit enough and they're not contained in all the various policies they need to be in. So just the cumulative weight of decision after decision after decision, a lot of which are reversing old NLRB positions on these issues, uh, are really causing concern for employers and requiring them to constantly look at their social media policies and constantly 
uh, rewrite them and uh, wonder whether even the rewritten policies are going to be subject to legal attack. Is there an example of a social media policy that has held up to NLRB scrutiny and been seen as lawful? Sure. There are several provisions that the NLRB says that an employer can still include. For example, you can prohibit employees from disclosing your trade secrets on social media or your truly confidential information. Um, you can prohibit employees, for example, from just flat out ridiculing coworkers or supervisors if there's no discussion of terms or conditions of employment. You know, just going online and making fun of someone, uh, employers can generally prevent that. So. You know, th those types of really outside the bounds activities are probably still okay, but once you move beyond that, you're getting into a gray area very quickly. So, what do you think this means for employers? Does this mean you're better off without a standalone social media policy? You know, I don't think most employers are, are probably willing to uh, to come to that conclusion yet. Um, I, I think. What we are coming to is a situation where really anything in the policy that could be deemed to affect employees' ability to talk about their wages, safety issues, terms and conditions of employment is probably going to be out of bounds unless there are severe limitations put in the policy and, and very explicit disclaimers. I, I do think that employer social media policies need to concentrate on the outside the bounds activity that I described a minute ago and probably also to focus on the more positive aspects of social media use. You know, so much of what we see is don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, but the policy really should talk about productive uh, and appropriate uses of social media that, that help the business. Uh, and perhaps the policies can concentrate more on that than the, the prescriptive uh, language that we've seen in the past. Now, recently, I think it was just last month, a white shoe uh, labor and employment law firm put out a report um, sort of benchmarking you know, social media usage in the workplace. And one interesting finding in the report, albeit the research methodology was really not that compelling. It was about, I think they interviewed 110 uh, general counsel. And um, uh, what they found was that while 80% of the companies they talked to have a social media policy, um, over the last 16 months, social media misuse that required disciplinary action has doubled from 35% to 70%. So how would you interpret that? What does that mean? Well, I think it's probably a situation where the employers are paying more attention to this. They're more savvy regarding social media. They have people within their organizations that are doing a better job monitoring the company's reputation uh, and the company's mentioning on social media. So it, it may not be that employees are doing more than they've done in the past. It just may be that employers are getting better at, at picking up on this uh, and addressing it when they find it. What are you seeing in your practice with respect to mis misuse? Are you seeing more misuse, significantly more, the same? I, I don't think I'm seeing more misuse. Um, I, I do think that employers are at the same time becoming more sensitive to this, but they're becoming a little bit more savvy, and, and they are picking and choosing situations more where, where they're really only reacting to this when there is a true reputational threat to the company. Um, or a legal threat or loss of confidential information or something like that. I, I think that, that the lawyers have done a good job training them that, you know, employees going on Facebook and complaining that they don't like their supervisor, you know, probably the appropriate uh, uh, area for you to, to stake your, the, the reputation of your social media policy or the legality of your social media policy. And so what advice moving forward would you have companies that are, looking at this area, maybe thinking about updating their policy, and concerned about running afoul of NLRB rules and regs? Yeah. Well, we, we talk with them about what are the true concerns here? What is the nature of your business? What have you seen in the past in terms of social media use uh, or social media in general that has negatively affected your business? And then once we understand the, the actual concerns that are there, how can we best structure a policy within these, you know, these increasing limits that we have that will address it uh, and, in essence, will communicate our story to our employees, will tell them why we're concerned about this and why it's in their interest and the company's interest to make sure that there's responsible use of social media. So it doesn't have to be, you know, again, prescriptive all the time, you know, thou shalt not. 
it, it can ask the employees to help partner with the company to make sure that we are being portrayed accurately uh, and appropriately on social media. And, and, you know, a lot of times most employees understand that and will respond appropriately to it. Jonathan Crowder at the law firm, Parker Poe in Charlotte, thank you for joining us. Thank you. You've been listening to On the Record Online with Eric Schwartzman, the podcast about how technology is changing the world of communications. To subscribe to the podcast or share feedback, visit us online at ontherecordpodcast.com, on Twitter at OnTheRecord, or send email to ontherecordpodcast at gmail.com.